God of War Ragnarok is gaming's number one father-son simulator where one of them doesn't have to die tragically in order to win game of the year. It just pretends that it's going to happen. I've seen discussion on whether this or Elden Ring is 2022's best game. Seeing as I never bothered sending Elden Ring, you can probably determine which I think is the rightful winner of Jeff Keighley's game of the year as long as my bestest best friend Hideo Kojima didn't release a game award. However, I will give God of War Ragnarok the best case scenario award for making the most out of a narrative that began as a power fantasy around Greek myths for you to then violently kill or violently have sex with, into a narrative about becoming better than your more simple and violent origins by getting married to a supportive partner, raising a son with firm discipline, and refusing to kill people who are practically begging for it, before finally, begrudgingly, killing them while stating how much you didn't want to. I blame taking lead out of gasoline for the more sensitive tonal shift in modern video games. Back when people who had unknowingly poisoned their brains were in charge of development, they created a slew of characters who hated their parents, society, women, and themselves. A psychotic golden age ruled by angry gasoline gods. But with the new unleaded crop of developers in charge of direction, we are being drowned in nuance. Lest our creations have ugly edges that challenge modern societal norms instead of explanations for why they are temporarily inconvenienced by a psychological dilemma or a moral choice. I'm being mean. After all, the characters are well realized and acted, and I was especially pleased with how the Norse gods were given more death than the shallow assholes the Greek gods were made out to be. But if I'm expected to forget the absurdity of the old games and juxtapose with the new, that isn't happening, especially when such a large portion of it concerns Kratos' death. Again, they did manage to avoid turning the Norse chapter into three games this time, unlike God of War 2 and 3, which were just the same game split into two. I don't know who decided that games set in Norse mythology have to be so long, but this and Assassin's Creed Valhalla are both drinking from the same mug of reindeer piss. But, as I've always held, the gameplay should decide the length, not the other way around, which would be the Assassin's Creed approach. Not much has changed gameplay-wise since the last game, except for playable Atreus sections. Taking the old, if it ain't broke, why make it any better approach? But since the gameplay was so meaty, it managed to get away with that for one more game without feeling tired despite the game's length, though I will say the game feels a bit easier this time around. For the first half of the game, I found myself wondering if Kratos logged onto his Smurf account before heading to a new area. Probably has something to do with how whenever you are about to be punished by an enemy, your companion will yell a warning or tell you exactly what to do to avoid it. I'm used to being backseated during my Twitch streams, but not in-game by the characters themselves. The ease might have been warranted had Kratos started the game with all the upgrades he had at the end of his 2018 outing, but this time they finally stopped trying to come up with a reason for why Kratos loses all the abilities in the first 10 minutes of the new game. He just has this time, somehow losing all the armor and upgrades to his weapons and health, and the game just shrugs its shoulders and mumbles something about Fimblewinter breaking things down. Except for things without an upgrade path. I guess the lesson is that no matter how well crafted the narrative, the truly weak parts of it are the ones that every game has to sacrifice for the sake of being a video game sequel, even ones that are nominated for Game of the Year. There is some heavy unaccounted for irony having Kratos mourn his dead wife by fondling the bag that carried her ashes, while still wearing the ashes of his first dead wife. I'm amazed Atreus was even able to hunt a deer. Fimble Winter has been going on for three years now. No vegetation means deer starve to death, but life seems to be doing fine despite the apocalyptic winter. Kratos finally learned his son's name. Now if only he could reveal what their family name is. I don't think even his first wife and daughter knew that one. Dog sledding is a new travel feature in Ragnarok, which Kratos somehow steers with his mind. Since there's no lead connecting to the wolves pulling it, Kratos just holds onto the handlebars and the wolves just know where he wants to go. Freya attacks him on their way home, which should be impossible for her, because Odin cursed her to never be able to leave Midgard and to never be able to attack anyone, even in self-defense. That's just one of many things the game shoves under the carpet with lazy Fimblewinter excuses. Don't set up rules for your characters if you aren't going to follow through with them in the next game. One of the disappointing things of this adaptation of Norse myth is how little of the Ragnarok myth was utilized. Loki's children, Finrir and Jormungandr, are both present but barely utilized, here only to have their origins explained in a less messed up way than the actual myths, but for no real payoff despite how interesting a concept they are and how important they were to the mythos, especially in the deaths of Thor and Odin. Putting out one candle doesn't change the ambience of the room enough to help you go to sleep. With two dead wives in his past, it's a wonder Kratos gets any sleep with all the haunting flashbacks he must have. <laughs> That isn't where Kratos placed the Leviathan Axe before going to sleep. It was on the post along with the Blades of Chaos closer to the door. He crawled through here. Atreus crawled through here while carrying a dead wolf larger than himself. I don't think Fenrir's body would even fit through that crevice. Atreus. Another second and that would have been child number two Kratos killed without realizing it. You'd think this moment would have more of an effect on him. Focus. If only that's how healing actually worked in the game. I have to find green crystals and step on them. Can I come in? Ah. 
I have meat. I'm going to take a sin off for both sticking to the sequel bait ending of the last game and then subverting it a second later. Though there is a lot more snow than seen in the original shot, Thor shouldn't be able to come to Kratos' home. There's a new stave of protection Atreus put up, which is what kept everyone away in the last game until Kratos cut down one of the trees forming it, and if Freya can't break it, I don't see Thor breaking it either. Thor brought mead, but he's actually stopped drinking, so he pours himself a cup knowing he isn't going to drink it. As much as I enjoy this scene, it doesn't make much sense for Odin to send Thor in first to do nothing, when Odin is the one going to be doing all the talking anyway. I suppose this was a consequence of teasing Thor's arrival at the end of the last game instead of Odin. There were some misunderstandings. Regrettable ones. But I think we all have a better idea of who we're dealing with. I really enjoyed Odin's portrayal in this game. He's like Dumbledore crossed with a mafia boss. How does peace strike the esteemed retired god of war how about we just don't kill each other how about you stay home kick up your feet seek no quarrel with me and i'll have none with you odin offers a pretty good deal a deal so good that had kratos taken it i don't know how odin would have moved forward with his own plan since he needs atreus in order to complete it no matter what kratos chose he would end up in conflict with odin of course it means that that one that one has to stop his search for Tyr. Tyr's old ways are dead. He is dead. You understand? Revealing that he knows Atreus has been searching for Tyr, who is supposed to be dead, and warning him from continuing confirms Tyr is alive, since you don't warn people to stop searching for a corpse. Also, Odin goes from warning Atreus away from searching for Tyr, to using that to his advantage right after this. So this negotiation makes even less sense in the long run. So what do you say? No. Considering the last deal Kratos made with a god went profoundly bad for him, I don't blame him for not taking this one despite its favorable terms. But I would like to hear his reasoning at least, since he himself doesn't want a conflict with the Aesir or Atreus to be involved. Don't take all day. About time. Odin needs Atreus for his plan. Sicking Thor on Kratos would normally make Atreus less likely to trust Odin right after he finished claiming he doesn't want conflict. You're not from here. We got a tradition called a blood payment. It means I get a piece of you for what you took from my family. You'll pick it up. Badass fight, but Thor never takes a piece of Kratos. The fight ends with Kratos leaving a permanent axe wound in Thor's stomach and knocking out one of his teeth. What does he want? To uh, pay for the roof. And he invited me to Asgard. A strange thing to do after he sick Thor on Atreus' dad, while Atreus still had no idea if he was even alive. I'm more surprised Atreus wasn't trying to put arrows in Odin after the attack. Why were you searching for Tia? If I told you I was looking for him, you would have said not to. So you hid the truth. How exactly would Kratos fail to notice his son traveling all over Midgard looking for Tyr? Must have been some awfully long times where he was gone after saying he was using the bushes. What is this lad? Where are we? Somewhere only giants were meant to see. These shrines tell their stories to the world. But it turns out the real stories, the secret stories, those they kept here, inside. The Jotnar shrines from the last game that tell of their history are just the first layer. Only Jotnar can truly open them to see the prophecies they contain. But the question I have is why? What purpose does it serve to build shrines that contain the prophecies of the Jotun, but build them outside of Jotunheim and make it only so Jotuns can open them? But someone comes along and rescues the moon, and then the moon blocks out the sun. This is a lot of work one Jotun went through to foretell that this game would have a day-night puzzle mechanic in one realm. Here's Ragnarok. Do you see who's leading the armies against Odin? That's Tyr. If he's gonna be around at Ragnarok, that means he's gotta be alive. Previously, the Jotun prophecies used art that resembled Kratos enough that you couldn't confuse it for anyone else. Now they use a generic figure that could be anyone and Atreus assumes it to be Tyr, even though it will actually be Kratos. When I was inside one of the shrines, I saw an image of Tyr imprisoned, but I couldn't tell where. There are hints inside the other shrines. They mention black smoke and the bleeding earth. The Jotuns got that one very wrong. They saw Odin pretending to be Tyr locked up in Svartalheim, but not the actual Tyr who was imprisoned in Niflheim. Think I get it. If you freeze the geyser, the pressure will turn the wheel. I would tell you all about the puzzle design of the game if I had gotten a chance to experience it, but as soon as I encountered something without a health bar that required me to whack it into the right position, my companion would speak up and give me the solution if the game detected I spent more than 10 seconds thinking about it. The only puzzle the game feels you can handle without it are ironically the worst. I'm speaking of rune arrow puzzles, where you have to make a chain of glowing circles that overlap to light something up, usually for an important health upgrade. Not once did the bastards want to offer me helpful advice on those. I was halfway through the game before I realized I could shoot the same spot three times and make the bubble bigger 
Whitaker, since the game neglected to mention that fact. Really collect on something, pal? Think uh, parading a severed head around on your hip is gonna scare me into somehow approving Astrid's accretion proposal, eh? People often notice Mimir, despite him being on Kratos' back and out of sight. Durin gives them a fine for their actions, but it's actually a bit of subterfuge, since he wrote directions to the mine they're looking for. Odin would have only just placed himself in the mine for his deception, so Durin should be unaware of it. Kratos and Atreus take a train up the mountain, but despite the steepness of the slope, they were never affected by the pull of gravity, sitting perfectly upright in their seats despite the 110 degree angle they were on. Okay, we need to go left. Wait, I meant my left. You pointed in that direction and you are facing the same direction as him. Your left is his left. Oh, come on. You can jump that. Your knees aren't that bad. Kratos doesn't even have a jump button anymore, kid. His old double jump would have blown your mind. You could just lift the beam off the door instead of ripping the entire door down. They find Tyr locked up inside the mines, but it's revealed much later this is actually Odin disguised as Tyr. Odin may have known Atreus was looking for Tyr, but he had no way of knowing they would come to Svartalheim to find him. They were only pointed in this direction by a Jotun shrine that only Atreus could access and Odin knew nothing of. Furthermore, Odin locked down realm travel. The only reason they could reach Svartalheim was due to the hack Sindri and Brock came up with, which Odin was also unaware of. But if you want me to follow you to war, or worse yet, lead you to it, Then kill me now. My fight is gone. Tyr has been playing a lot of The Last of Us 2 during his imprisonment, absorbing its message. After bringing Tyr back to Sindri's house and being disappointed that he's a pacifist, Atreus decides now would be the best time to sneak away and try to convince Freya to join them, meaning you take control of Atreus for a few parts of the game. He's not terrible to play, just not as satisfying as Kratos. More limited and just reminds you of the myriad of Sony games where you play as someone with a bow. How about I suggest an alternative? Something much less risky, but maybe could give you some answers. What are you talking about? A certain old friend you haven't seen in a while. A very giant friend. Jormungandr? Did you find him? Jormungandr is in the exact same place they met him last time. Not sure why Atreus thought it was missing. Iron. What is that? What is that? I don't even know what Atreus asked Jormungandr, or why Sindri suggested they come see it. All they get is the word Ironwood out of it, and then it's off to see Freya because this was a big flop. I'd love to know how Freya saw the mistletoe arrowhead that killed Balder, that Atreus tucked into his shirt just so she wouldn't see it. Leave this place. Go and do not return. Go before I change my mind. Meeting Jormungandr and then Freya has produced zero results, and Atreus wonders why his dad doesn't trust him. There was an accident at the forge. Brock. Died. I couldn't accept it. I went to the Lake of Souls in Alfheim to steal him back. Legions of souls tried to stop me. I can still feel them crawling all over my skin. Thing is, I could only get three of his four soul parts back. You can just bring the dead back to life here by traveling to the Lake of Souls and finding their soul parts, which is knowledge that seriously undermines a key part of the plot. Where have you been? Peeing? Kratos is still falling for that even after learning Atreus has been up to things behind his back. Where are we going? Alfheim. Home of the elves. Alfheim? You hate Alfheim. Why would we move there? Move there? Oh, we are seeking information. The shrine of Groa, young one. Your father tells me you found it there. Kratos only humored Atreus by helping him find Tyr. Now he's the one suggesting they go check the Jotnar Shrine of Groa they found in Alfheim for more prophecy clues. My goodness, what a strapping physique. Capable of an astounding variety of acts of violence, I imagine. What is happening? I'm down for the more serious attempt at character development in the series, but the addition of funny talking animals concerned me. Anyway, now that I've polished off all this resin for you, would you like the seed back? How exactly did you polish the seed in your mouth while talking normally until now? There's a few too many reused areas in the sequel. Retreading old levels with a few minor changes is the realm of Dielsaheim. The mythical sanctuary for giants. Curious. So it's in Jodenheim? I know some giants thought so, but Ironwood isn't anywhere, lad. It's a concept, a metaphorical paradise. It's not real. You live in a world with nine mystical realms of reality, and you think a paradise existing in the most mysterious one is unlikely. She lied. Oh, I lied. Of course she did. 
Odin's working off a false prophecy. Tyr, learning that Groa's prophecy of Ragnarok destroying the Nine Realms was a lie and that only Asgard would be destroyed and Odin killed, should alter whatever plans he has been working on to avert it. But he does nothing with his new information. If Ragnarok only results in the destruction of Asgard, why are all the realms currently affected some way by Fimblewinter? What even is Fimblewinter now if Ragnarok is just a big monster blowing up Asgard? After fighting with his dad over his prophecy again, Atreus goes to sleep and wakes up in Ironwood inside Jotunheim. There had to be a better way of getting here than just falling asleep and waking up where he needed to be for the plot. A Jotun's ability to perceive the future can be rather hit or miss. Angra Boda was able to predict her first meeting with Atreus right down to him pointing a knife at her. But when she shows him the reproduction of the mural he and his father saw at the end of the last game, it shows Kratos dying in Atreus' arms, which ends up being the completely wrong person, and sets up the next arc of Atreus' story in a falsehood. Furries have forever ruined the appeal of turning into a wolf. That cannot be my future. It says I serve Odin and my father dies. Just a guess, but I don't think Kratos has told Atreus all the stories of his past. Dying isn't a big deal for him, but the game wants you to take this death prophecy very seriously, even though he was fated to die in the first game and did, fated to die in the second game as well and did, and then died again in the third game for good measure. Just forget about that now. Forget the future. Forget Loki. Forget about your father's impending death and you serving Odin, and help me do chores for the next hour. The rest of Atreus' time in Ironwood is spent doing their best to emulate an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. An odd influence for a God of War game, to be sure. Let's grab it. Who's it for? Wolves gotta eat, don't they? I'm starting to think Jodens are the worst kind of vegan. The ones who place their pets on a vegan diet. These are the giants. They had a choice. They could stay in Jotunheim. Waiting for Odin to find a way in to slaughter them. Or they could hide. My father helped whisper their souls into these. They sure showed Odin, killing themselves and running away. Nobody believed this place was real. They're gonna be so surprised. Loki, you can't tell anyone about Ironwood. Not even your father. There isn't a good reason why Atreus can't tell Kratos about the Ironwood. It's not like he's going to tell Odin about it. And what would Odin even do with it? It's just a forest with two giants living in it. Oh, damn time. Given how big Angraboda's grandmother is, there is no way they could have missed her dragging the wolf away. It's either altruistic or one hell of a prank to place the soul of a giant into a snake. The fact that some giants remain normal human height and some grow as large as a mountain must have made for an interesting society. We only deal with the six foot dilemma. Can't imagine what it's like when someone expects you to be at least 12 stories tall. You really can sleep your way to and from Jotunheim. They had to go on an entire quest to get here in the last game. What were you thinking? I... I wanted to visit Fenrir. For two days. I... Do not lie to me again! Does time pass that fast in Jotunheim? A few hours there was two days in Midgard. None of the other realms worked that way. Angra Boda is supposed to be the same age as Atreus, but I don't see how that can be or stay that way given the time flow difference. Maybe. For the moment. You are of more use to me. Alive. Lady, if you knew how many times he's climbed out of the underworld after dying, you'd have given up on killing him years ago. Come on then. You had a way around Odin's curse this whole time. By turning into a bird, Freya can bypass Odin's curse and stay in Vanaheim. Yet another rule they decided was too limiting for them. I find it odd that Freyr keeps an empty sword scabbard on his back just for one scene toward the end of the game. It makes no sense for him to wear it since he lost Ingrid centuries ago. The female dwarf that cuts Brock down from the tribe is actually his old friend he came here with them to see. And not once during the standoff did she speak up and mention that fact. The Yggdrasil roots binding Freya's curse are protected by Nidhogg. And for the first time in the Norse saga, I can take a sin off for a great boss fight. Something the previous game was seriously lacking in. Skull and Hadi are in Vanaheim? We learned the giants rescued them from Odin and brought them here. If the sun and moon only said due to Skull and Hadi chasing them and they are currently only in Vanaheim, how does sunset and sunrise work in the other realms? Like her brother Freya, Freya is wearing an extra scabbard on her back for when she reclaims a sword she left here after her marriage to Odin. Who goes out wearing two scabbards but only carries one sword? Look, I was only thinking about going to Odin. 
But I swear it's for a good reason. There is no good reason to go to Odin. He'll only cloud your mind. With Tyr actually being Odin, you'd think this is what he would have been trying to convince Atreus to do while disguised. But Atreus came to this conclusion only after seeing the prophecy of his father's death and himself serving Odin. Odin didn't seem to have a plan in place for getting Atreus to come to him. I gotta stop something bad from happening. Also said prophecy foretold Atreus would serve Odin. By making one part of the prophecy come true, you aren't somehow negating the other. There's also the little problem that Atreus has no way to Asgard, so he threw a fit and runs away with no plan on how to accomplish his goal. There are lines you know exist only because of popular memes from the last game. Atreus didn't have to walk around the branches of the Erd tree like normal after traveling through a mystic gate. There's also no mystic gate behind him to come out where he landed. One tiny fire that will go out in minutes is enough to warm up and save the life of the turtle that serves as Freya's house. Why did she abandon it to sleep out in the cold to begin with? Just because she was sad and angry doesn't mean she had to be cold and miserable. Due to Atreus' lack of planning, it's up to the plot to provide him with a way to Asgard with Odin's raven showing up, just like when the plot provided him an easy way to Ironwood. This current sure is moving Atreus fast for what is actually a placid and still lake once you get out of it. I'm gonna go climb that wall now. In the span of three short years, Atreus went from needing to cling to his father's back when climbing to a world champion free climber. What part of the enormous wall made you think, oh, visitors must be well. Do they teach that eating an apple makes for asshole behavior in creative writing classes or something? Yes, I'm Stop. going to drop you. Goodbye. Atreus managing to grab Heimdall's arm before falling shouldn't have been possible given Heimdall's power. Atreus can't even touch him later when they fight, even when Heimdall isn't looking. You just met me. And I can already see you are eager to prove yourself. Way too eager. Probably due to an overshadowing father figure you can never live up to. Heimdall's power means he perceives everything about a person. His is a power that will only seem to work when the plot needs it to work. Whoa. Are these all Aesir gods? What? You think all Aesir are gods? Well, that seemed like the most straightforward assumption. If not all Aesir are gods, how does your godhood work? Is it anything like the Jotnar where not all of them are giants? Help us! I brought you a practice dummy. I thought we were going to Odin. You see, the thing is, you do not retrograde it. So I am not letting you anywhere near the all So first Heimdall pulled Atreus up the wall instead of dropping him, only to sick her yar on him and then attack him himself after he brought him into the Great Hall where Odin resides. The boy is false, our father. This young man, who is my guest... If Atreus is your guest, why did you drop him outside the wall, forcing him to climb it just to reach you? With Heimdall being able to see the truth of a person, he should be able to perceive that Odin is a manipulator who uses everyone, including Heimdall himself. Yet Odin is the only person he trusts and respects, blindly even. I don't think we should talk about my father. Not well, huh. <laughs> Can't blame him. Between my ex-wife and my disgruntled former employee, he's not exactly getting an unbiased view. Odin knowing that Freya is with Kratos and Mimir should set off alarm bells. This isn't some little fact that would be easy to go unnoticed, as Freya was previously trying to kill Kratos. If I'm being honest with you, Loki, you're lucky my offer still stands after you went and sprung tear. Odin admits the very first thing he ever told Atreus was a lie, but Atreus will still start to trust him knowing that. Your brother. Really? I had no idea. Uh-huh. And now it's yours. God sure are forgiving up here in the north compared to their Greek cousins. Thrud becomes best friends with Atreus despite him killing her brothers and her uncle without so much as an apology. You know what drives me? What I really want? I want answers. Same as you. See, mortals have it easy. When they push up against life's big questions, they can look to us. To give them meaning, divine comfort. <laughs> we both know that's a sham. But when we have questions, why are we here? To give meaning to mortals while living without it ourselves? No. While I love the idea that Odin's problem is that he's a god having an existential crisis over purpose and meaning, I find that his solution being a reference to a Jim Carrey comedy from the 90s that itself only referenced Loki in passing to be a massive disappointment. Can we just look inside? I wouldn't recommend that. Mimir stated in the last game that Odin clawed out his own eye after he tricked him into drinking from a well laced with hallucinogenic mushrooms. Now he lost it from staring into the rift without the mask. Recognize any writing on it? Odin never knew that part of Atreus' godhood included the power to speak any language. So how did he figure Atreus could translate the runes of the mask for him? Smoldered earth and obsidian spark 
and a field of battles never fought. Why would the mask, which is broken into three pieces, have runes leading to where the other broken pieces can be found carved into it? I assume the mask was created whole and then shattered somehow, but it already included a poem where the broken pieces would end up. And for a mask that isn't from the Nine Realms, why would its pieces be found here? Also, figuring out the riddles on the mask seems unnecessary. The mask glows when pointed in the direction of one of its pieces. They could just try each realm until they got a signal, then follow it. Listen, Modi had some problems, but he was my son. And the only reason you aren't mush right now is because of that broken piece of wood. You're the one that beat him to near death, then sent him back to Midgard for no reason after Magni had already been killed. Atreus tricks Thor into trying Surtur's trials while he checks out Surtur's shrine. This is about as close as Atreus ever comes to being a god of tricks and deceit. Small world of the mass piece just happened to be right next to the trial area and Surtur's shrine. And the world gets smaller, because Angraboda is here to check the shrine for soul marbles as well. They even became friends. Ah, uh, good friends. Are they? Yeah. I think they are. You've got to use your imagination when it comes to Jotnar's Norse Hub videos. We can read it all. But you can't translate it. Not yet. Atreus translated the other phrase in the mask in seconds. Now it requires days to translate the next section. Single take transitions are hard enough to do when you have only one character to focus on. Spread between two people in two different locations means you end up with these weird scenes where Loki puts down his knife on a table and Kratos picks up an identical knife from an identical table on his end. They Help. are the fates of these lads, are they not? I would know what they know. You don't need witches who weave fate to tell you that Atreus is in Asgard. Once the wolves have the scent of the Norns, we'll just need to follow their lead. The Norns reside under a lake. No wolf is sniffing out their trail. And a trail would imply they're out there walking around sometime. Their fur is matted. When did you last brush them? They are wolves. And matted fur leads to disease. Take care of them and they'll take care of you. Says the lady who left her turtle house to freeze. Death can have me when it earns me. Kratos would make a fine presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. The wolves lead them to two different illusory walls that contain nothing. But why were there illusory walls to nothing to begin with? According to Freya, this is the work of the Norns, who presumably like to leave scent trails leading to fake walls before finally allowing you to find them. Kratos, Ghost of Sparta, Bane of Olympus, Destroyer of Fate, Cruel Strider. Imagine being the warrior the Norns sent out to fight Kratos, and you hear them listing all of Kratos' titles. How many times does this make someone who's used an illusion like this against Kratos, and it never ever works? Honestly, I'm not sure why the Norns are even screwing with them like this. They're not at all hostile. They just want to troll. It's a good thing Atreus isn't here to meet the Kelpie. If you know, you know. You come to us, piteous archetypes, seeking freedom from your scripts. As if knowing your lines would grant you the power to rewrite them. Speak plain. Normally I despise when developers try to be meta, but I enjoy everything about the depiction of the Norns as oracles who are reading the game script and state that you can only foresee the outcome of simple characters and their actions. There is no grand design, no script, only the choices you make. That your choices are so predictable merely make us seem prescient. This contradicts God of War 2 where the Sisters of Fate did have that power, and this is the same world. And because you kill gods, but what Kratos did, it was not out of hate. Should I bring him a crown then? He still slays gods, but now he's sad about it? The game is sinning itself. I approve. Because your choices never change, you will learn that Heimdall intends to kill your son in Asgard, and you will do what you do best. And then Ragnarok. The skies burn, the curtains fall. Exunt Omni. Heimdall. He only learns that from you, just now. Had you not told him Heimdall intends to kill Atreus, none of that other stuff would happen. I enjoyed your story, Kratos. Pity it has to end so soon. Well, on that part, they're wrong. This is only the halfway point, and the game is left open for future sequels. What is this? That's the noose, brother. The one Odin hanged himself with. That was a really skinny branch for Odin to hang himself from. The plan to beat Heimdall is to overwhelm his senses by creating a spear that can turn into more spears, which I don't see being a great difference from Atreus shooting a lot of arrows at him earlier to no avail. Atreus can even shoot magic arrows that split into three, summon flocks of spirit animals and it did nothing. But a handful of spears that go pop can turn the tide on Heimdall. 
Since Odin knows Kratos is planning to kill Heimdall, and the exact method he's going to use, he could give Heimdall some warning about it. Gjallarhorn is important enough that at least taking it away from Heimdall for safekeeping would be a smart move. I will take a sin off for this being the first God of War game where I didn't ignore all the weapons for just one or two. Granted, there's only three, but a lot more identity and usefulness was put into them than in the past games. Yep, guess we're doing this one boy style. Mmm, you lasted so long, but you just couldn't resist making a boy joke. It's the key to peace in our age, to break free from all this fate and prophecy. My son is not your key. Oh god, do they not have metaphor in your homeland? Or rather, did they? I wonder just how much Hades from Disney's Hercules inspired Odin in this game. What do you even know of Godhood? In your lifetimes, has anyone ever worshipped you? Ever prayed to you? He was pretty well loved by the Spartans, I recall. The first game even ended with Gaia narrating about how Kratos would be worshipped by every person who went to war for all time. Kratos only puts out one candle whenever he sleeps and leaves the rest burning. These two were punching identical walls, huh? Really beginning to stretch for that one take. When it blinded me, I thought it was over that I'd never see inside again. And then I found this. And I knew that it would finally let me see the answers. You just knew? Just up and found a broken wooden mask and realized, yep, this is what I need to stare into a crack in reality. The writing really breaks down when it comes to the plot McGovern. I don't know where I go when I go. There's no Valhalla for me. Ragnarok cannot be the end. I need to know there's something more than this. Well, I don't know about all gods, but Athena died and turned into some kind of spirit. Kratos even died as a god and he just fell into Hades like everyone else. Kratos could tell Odin of this and clear up this existential crisis of his. The writing on here talks about a cold breath. Breath. Wind. It's gotta be hell on. Again, why would there be writing on the mask about the locations of the broken pieces of itself? The only way this would make sense if the mask was created, directions inscribed onto it, then intentionally broken and hidden, just for this game of scavenger hunt across the realms. Whoa, 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 hold up. You don't want to walk into the blistering cold of Helheim without this. Every lao should keep you nice and toasty. Well, at least they remembered that bit of the last game, but they're still retconning it because Mimir stated not even Odin could survive the cold of Helheim. Maybe he's locked up for a good reason. I can feel what he's feeling. It's a giant thing. Look, he just wants to be free. I'm sure everything that's locked up wants to be free, including those who are incredibly dangerous and guilty. Atreus picked the wrong ice realm to explore, but even though the third piece isn't in Helheim, the mass still glowed and led him to a dead end for no explainable reason. Absolute, unqualified, moral. You know that thing tears holes between realms, right? Why were they not warned about Garm if they were going to be searching in the same area as him for the mask? I think I want to go home now. Okay, if that's what you want. I meant it when I said you're not a prisoner here. It's your choice. Go, clear your mind. I know you'll be back. As much as I like the idea that Odin is confident enough with his manipulation that he would let Atreus leave, I have to wonder what makes him so sure that Atreus would return to finish the mask later. When you do decide you're ready to continue our work here, Hugin will be waiting for you in your old home. Atreus thinks nothing of Odin knowing that he isn't returning to the cabin in the Wildwoods, referring to it as his old home. And I set him free. I, I thought that if- Gone! Great bleeding fuck lad, you feed gum! If there's one aspect of the game that disappoints me, it's how it shies away from the more weird elements in Norse mythology. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, a lesser game in every way that matters, was willing to depict Fenrir as the messed up wolf child of Loki and Angriboda, whereas here, Atreus just places the soul of his dead pet wolf Fenrir into Garm. It's a dead end. He's been faffing around with that since before I knew him. You're wrong, Mimir. This mask is no fraud. Giants didn't make it, and only a few of them ever glimpsed it in their visions. Why would Tyr persuade them that the mask is really important to Odin? Shouldn't he want them to think the mask is nothing special? Odin had Heimdall steal the moon in Vanaheim and place it into a box because Ragnarok begins once Skull and Hati catch it. But then they just left the box in Vanaheim under light guard instead of bringing it to Asgard. As Tyr, Odin even knew these two were headed to Vanaheim to help Freya and Freyr, but once again did nothing with his inside information. The spears don't end up mattering that much against Heimdall. Kratos just starts punching faster after surprising Heimdall by bursting one of the spears into wind. And after that first hit, he can no longer effortlessly dodge your attacks. For someone who's obsessed with stopping Ragnarok, Odin sure didn't use the information that Kratos would kill Heimdall and take the horn that sounds it very seriously, since he didn't do anything to avoid Heimdall being killed. 
They let Freyr keep his flying boat on him after taking him captive. This escape was planned on that still being with him. All these wyverns are the archers and Kratos with his spear are too slow to hit, and Birger can just jump out of a boat and nail one of them with a sword, which causes it to ram into the other. Birger may be able to roll out of fall damage, but Kratos can block it with his shield. How Atreus survived the fall is a mystery though. If there is truly a source of infinite knowledge, you can't let Odin have it. Odin is standing there listening in on this plan and will not only take no precautions, but will leave the completed mask in Atreus's hand to deal with Siv accusing Atreus of killing Heimdall. Feeding Fenrir is going to be hell now. Uh, how'd you find me here? Loki? This is my marble. Tossing Atreus a marble with Loki's name on it doesn't explain how you knew where his house was. So I figured out what went wrong. I mistranslated a word here. Did you know? I thought it said beyond the cry of cold breath, but it actually reads the cry of first breath. It took you that long to figure out that the other icy realm mentioned on the mask might be Niflheim. Weapons aren't allowed inside. We'll have to check them. No weapons in the mead hall is an odd role for a tavern that serves only Inanyar and Aesir gods, one of which is immortal, and the other have already died and only come back after dying again. We'll greet Mjolnir. But they said you had to turn in your weapons when entering the meat hall. Quiet, boy! My name is- I thought this scene would have gone down between Atreus and his dad. Doesn't change anything though. During the brawl, Atreus is somehow pushing the big in here yar back with his feet, even though he's being held off the ground by him. I appreciate the amount of effort they put into humanizing the gods of the Norse mythology. Instead of making them into a list of bosses you have to check off, you end up not wanting to kill them, which does fit the theme of the game. Unlike the previous game where Baldur, Magni, and Modi never garnered sympathy, and were just better acted assholes than the ones from the Greek pantheon, there's more writing on this new chunk of mask, but whatever it says is unimportant. Odin leaves the completed mask, his obsession for who knows how long, in Atreus's hand while he speaks with the Valkyrie about Heimdall's death, and he knows that Atreus and his party are after the mask. Except begging your pardon, you don't have a way into Asgard. They got the big horn, don't they? Oh, so you expect them to sneak into Asgard, blowing a horn that sounds across all the realms? Am I the only one that recalls that Atreus is a giant wolf that rips holes between the realms? You could use Fenrir to reach Asgard. This is my purpose. One last time. I will pick up my spear and I will lead us to Asgard. Odin playing Tyr as a pacifist comes back to haunt him because this might have tricked him had he not. What was the actual plan Odin was going to spring on them? His way to Asgard is by ravens, which would give away his identity. And raven travel has to be by consent as stated earlier. If he was only going to take the mask back with him after getting his hands on it, he would still be at a loss since he needs Atreus to wear it. A better option would be to bring Thor, Valkyries, and every inner yar he can to Sindri's house and kill all of them except Atreus. The reveal that Tyr was Odin all along is only a surprise because Odin never made use of his role as an imposter outside of this one moment where he attempted to trick them and take the completed mask back. Everything that played out in the game would have happened regardless had he not disguised himself as Tyr. I don't even know what his goal was while doing this. The only thing he accomplished with his disguise was encourage Atreus and Kratos to bring about Ragnarok. Please, you have to save him. You have to. He can't. Atreus, now would be an excellent time for you to use that Jodan magic that lets you place a person's soul into an object like you did with Fenrir, because Brock is missing part of his soul and will receive no afterlife if he dies. The series finally succeeded in making someone's death a sad and memorable thing. Is there anything stopping Odin from warping back to Sindri's house with Thor and other Aesir to take the mask and horn back? Even if they cleared out his raven from the broom closet, he still knows this location. Ah! Is there a chance that we can bring Brock back? Sindri did it once. Maybe we could figure out a way to do it again. You never thought to ask that question when you were agonizing over your father's death prophecy. My friendship, my home, my secrets, my treasures, and you just kept taking. And now what have I got? <laughs> Not even my family. Moments like this remind me that I do in fact have empathy, and I hate that. This scene also marks the high water mark of the game, because the rest feels incredibly rushed from here on. First, Kratos decides that now is the time to go to war, even though he just gave the mask and horn to Freya and Freya and left saying he and Atreus were done. But seeing Sindri grieve has changed his mind and makes him return to being the god of war with his son by his side. Then they manage to unite the rest of the realms off screen to attack Asgard just like that. For a game so long, where it had time to go over so many parts in detail, it then speedruns its way through the event the game is named after. Why won't you help us? I don't 
want to. Elaborate. We'll die. Right. Because you've got so much to live for. Atreus is making himself a lot less likable right now. He spent most of this game trying to defy a prophecy laid out by the giants concerning his father's death, but expects Surtur to go along with a prophecy that will also end up killing him and his wife. Luckily for them, Kratos' Blades of Chaos can also transform Surtur into Ragnarok without also sacrificing his love Sinmara. You never see Sinmara, so this act doesn't mean much. She's only brought up to blindly grasp at emotions and the theme of not letting someone you love die due to prophecy. Those blades have been more useful in the Nine Realms than they ever were in the land they were forged in. It would have made a lot more sense for Odin to send his Valkyries to Sindri's house earlier after he failed to get the mask back than to send them to the spark of the world to stop them from creating Ragnarok. Eldest Vini, who took Mimir to Helheim with him to get Hel on their side for the battle, returned and left Mimir stuck on a gateway unprotected, with no idea if they would return by this gate. Kratos, your tent is to the right, and Atreus... Yours is to the left. I don't see you getting much rest in a cold-ass tent that isn't near a fire. There's an enclosed chamber with a forge fire right behind you. Then I will tell you a story. And he, he called for death to come to him. And when death arrived... Father, tell me a story that seems to imply your impending death so I can sleep soundly. Kratos giving a speech is the last thing I ever expected. Sometimes, subverting expectations can go a step too far. In the Norse mythos, Heimdall was the herald of Ragnarok and carried Gjallarhorn so he could sound it as a warning to the Aesir that Ragnarok had begun. Here, the horn actually enables Ragnarok by opening all the realm travel gates. There was no good reason for Heimdall to carry it around on him, since he would never blow it. With the realm towers of Muspelheim and Nibelheim destroyed by dwarven weapons, Ragnarok shouldn't be able to reach Asgard. But he does. Not that he accomplishes anything. His part in the game is another of those severely rushed moments that was introduced in the 11th hour, only to serve as background imagery for the fight since Atreus decides not to use him to breach Asgard's wall due to the humans Odin placed in front of it. Reminds me of another time, this series set up an apocalyptic assault on the home of the gods using titans that also went nowhere and was just window dressing. For some reason, Sindri has an off switch for the dwarven laser guns. Why would he do that? And how am I supposed to believe you? Because... he's right. Sif has hated Atreus since she first met him due to his part in Magni and Modi's death. But now, when he's part of the army besieging Asgard, she sides with him against Odin. Jormungandr joined the fight and was battling Thor in the distance, which could have been an amazing moment, but then Thor somehow knocks it back in time so it can have a role in the last God of War game. This has to be the single biggest waste of potential in the series. Odin kills Thor after he was defeated by Kratos and was about to finally stand up to his father. I can accept that Odin would do that, but he kills Thor by stabbing him with a spear. Kratos did far worse than that in this fight, stabbing him through his stomach with the Blades of Chaos and even stabbing him with his own spear. Kratos himself has been impelled on a god-killing sword and survived, but Thor couldn't take this. I think you're the only one who can craft a binding spell. If this is the same kind of binding spell that Odin put on you, did you need to be in his presence to use it? If so, then it's no better than attacking him directly, because if he already survived hanging himself for days on the tree, a few minutes of choking isn't going to kill him. All of them fell into the rift chamber in a group, but Atreus is alone upon hitting the ground. But this is your destiny, champion of the Jotnar. Only he can put on a mask. Only he can gaze into the truth of creation. And where exactly did you learn that bit of information from? That was never foretold in any of the shrines. And why would a Jotun be the only one who can wear the mask? The giants didn't make it and knew very little about it according to Odin. No! 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 Probably for the best. If it did anything like what it did to Jim Carrey, it would have seriously undermined the tone. Turns out the mural that depicted Kratos dying in Atreus' arms was actually Odin having his soul placed in a marble by Atreus. Hell of an oversight to make with your prophecy. Sindri grabs the marble and smashes it. And while that was definitely cathartic for him, Odin was already dead. That only released his soul from the marble. It's giant stuff. Giant stuff, also known as a load of bull. And I was right about Fenrir being able to get to Asgard by tearing holes between realms. They could have snuck right into the chamber where Odin's rift was and used the mask had they wanted. The only mythological battle the game saw fit to use was Freyr fighting and dying to Surtur. Not Odin dying to Fenrir or Thor to Jormungandr. Only the most inconsequential fight that had zero impact. Before Ragnarok, you promised to finish it if I fell asleep. <laughs> when death arrived, he asked why the old man had called for him. Seeing death before him caused the old man to reconsider his request. After a moment, he asked that death help him lift the logs onto his back. The second part of Kratos' story really doesn't live up to the narrative weight placed on it earlier. My shrine in Jotunheim 
She destroyed it. She didn't want us to know our fate. Then why did she have you go to that very specific mountain in Jotunheim to spread her ashes? That was her intended purpose, as stated at the end of the last game. There are other giants out there. And I've got to find them. I think I know where to look, but... They're my responsibility. And where exactly did you get an idea of where to look? At no point was there any information given on that. They left the Nine Realms and you don't know anything about the rest of the world. There's no real reason for Atreus to go and find them. They're probably doing just fine. So he's searching for no other reason than to meet them. Atreus wanting to leave right this minute by himself to go find the missing giants. Feels like the developers writing him out of the plot to give themselves room for any future game they might want to make. That's a sheer cliff Atreus is jumping off. Are you sure he's ready to be on his own? The back of Fae Shrine holds a hidden prophecy she made. One where Kratos is depicted as a god people love and worship for acts other than war and violence. I'll let the ending of God of War 1 contradict this. And from that point forward, throughout the rest of time, whenever men rode forth to battle for good cause or for evil, they did so under the watchful eye of the man who had defeated a god. They were driven forward by Kratos, the mortal who had become the new god of war. Game of the year winner is Elder Ring!